we have talked a lot about how we spend our time or on what things we spend it. Today, as you probably heard from April, what we want to talk about is not on the what of our time, but on the who. With whom do we spend our time? And before we say each to his own, spend it however we'd like, whether it's being a hermit or being a Hollywood socialite, we really have to go back to the beginning. And we kind of went through that in our confession a little bit. We really need to go back to the Bible, to Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, and even chapter 3. So I really would like you to have your Bibles open. We're going to go to the Gospel that was just read, so if you still have that open, keep it open to Matthew 14. But we're also going to go back to the very beginning. And there, in the words of Genesis chapter 1, and we said them, you said them today, in the image of God, he created them. It's kind of a foundational thing for all kinds of stuff. And what that means is that we, by nature, or I should say in the design that God had for human beings, uh, is that we were meant to walk with God and talk with God, uh, to reflect God, have a connection with Him, a relationship with Him. God, when He created mankind, implanted that very idea that very uh, existence and connection into our being. But that's not all he did. God also intended us to be in relationship with others. God said it is not good for the man to be alone. And so he gave him a helper that was suitable for him. Now, As we listen to those words, it says a man will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. Those words show us that God's design is for us to spend time with our spouse and truthfully as a first priority. Because that's the first earthly relationship that God created was between husband and wife. But when you listen to those words, it's a man will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. So while wife is first priority, we also see that we have relationships with those who are closest to us. Family, others who would be connected with us through Christ. And then finally, back to the beginning we see that God gives the command, and and Vicar Mike talked about this last week, and that is the command to, to multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, man's relationships would extend out into the world. That's the way God created us in a good and perfect world. Three different dimensions of relationships for us to live. Up with God, in with each other as fellow disciples and with our families, and then out into the community and the world. All three of those in balance with one another. Now if we go and continue on in Genesis, what we'd see is that sadly it did not take long for those relationships to get all messed up. And we confessed that earlier. In Genesis 3, we see where the sin takes place, eating from the tree that they weren't supposed to. But if we follow the story right after that, we see three really interesting things. The first is their reaction after they sin and God comes into the garden is they hide. They hide from God. The relationship was broken. Then we see Adam blaming Eve, throwing her under the bus, right? And the blame game begins. Eve starts to blame. What we see is that the relationship between husband and wife, between those who we are to be closest with, was broken. And then if we went to chapter 4 in Genesis, we would see that Cain killed Abel. 
and jealousy and fear that we would have of others and what they might have or what they might be doing, that fear and jealousy, you see, starts to grip the whole world and relationships are broken. And so it was into that broken world, this broken world, that Jesus came. Jesus came to redeem it, to restore it, to save it. And of course that meant he came to suffer and die on the cross, to pay the price for our sins of failed and broken relationships. But the reason that Jesus was able to do that the reason he was able to pay the price for those things and make that sacrifice was that he was the perfect sacrifice. Because Jesus came into this world to live in perfect relationship in all three of those dimensions, accomplishing God's perfect plan in our stead giving us credit for what he did, but also giving us a model and a picture of how to do the same going forward as a follower of Jesus, as his disciple. And so that's where Matthew 14, that was read earlier, comes into play. It is a great example for us to see how Jesus lived this out. So if you don't have Matthew 14 opened up, I'd encourage you to do so. It, it starts with verse 13. And in Matthew 14, verse 13, what we see is that Jesus goes off to a desolate place, the Bible says. A desolate place. He, he goes off on a retreat, might be another way to say it. Now, we can understand why he would have done so. Just before this scripture, what we see is that Jesus found out that his friend, his cousin, his forerunner or predecessor, John the Baptist, had been beheaded and been killed. You can see and understand why he'd need to get away. If you've ever experienced some kind of loss like that, of any kind, where you've gone through that kind of tragedy and sadness, you can understand the need sometimes to just get away and have a long conversation with God. And so that's what Jesus was going to do. It was a good thing for him to do that. But it's kind of interesting that if we go to the very next verse, in verse 14, or even at the end of 13, he doesn't even get there. It says, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. So he's pursued by the crowds. And his plan is thwarted. And if you continue on reading in those verses, you'd see a really interesting dynamic here. Instead of him saying to the crowd, look guys, I understand, but I have been through a lot today. I'm tired. I need to get away. I need some time to myself. He doesn't say that. He looks out at the crowd. The Bible says he has compassion on them. When Jesus saw all of those people, and there was thousands of them, as the story goes on to say, when he looked out on all those people, and he saw their sick, and he saw their brokenness. He suffered with them. That's what that really means. He suffered with them and he reached out to them. And he healed them. And he talked to them. And he loved them. Many of them, in fact, most of them, the great majority of them, as we look at what Scripture says at the end of Jesus' ministry and even in other accounts of this same story of the feeding of the 5,000, 
most of them, the majority of them, would not end up following Jesus. Even some of them who were following him left him right after this. But it didn't deter Jesus. He still reached out to them. He still reached out to them to the world around him, to the communities of Galilee, and he loved them, all of them, in the most basic way. He fed them. And when he was finished, he didn't forget what he had originally set out to do. He just engaged with the world because that was the opportunity and that's what was needed at that time. But he still needed to have his time with his father. And so after dismissing the crowd and getting them home before it got too late, Jesus went up onto the mountain and he prayed, the Bible says. He spent that one-on-one, -on -one, just he and God, doing that together. And, and according to the, the text, it was pretty much for most of the night until the early morning hours when he went out and he sought out his disciples whom he had sent on ahead of them to go to the other side of the lake. And as he went, his disciples were having a, a rough time buffeted by the waves. And so he walked out to them he went out to those who were his closest and best friends and he said to them, do not be afraid, it is I. I want you to think about what encouragement we can give to each other with the simple words and the presence of Jesus, sharing that presence of Jesus and his words with those whom we are closest with, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And even when they are struggling, even when they are sinking, when they are not able to get where they're trying to go because there's something fighting against them, how powerful is it for us to reach out to them, to put our hand out there, and pull them back in to reassure them and to rescue them. And so in less than 24 hours, in, in just that span of a day, what we see is Jesus living out his relationships in three dimensions. Up with his Father, in with his disciples, and out to the world and to the crowds doing so in different measure, but in perfect balance, spending time with each as the need and opportunity arose, doing so on our behalf to restore us to be able to do the same. We continue with our next song. Historically in the church calendar, Transfiguration Sunday. And in Luke's Gospel, if you were to, if you had your Bible open, you might have noticed it, that the proximity to the Transfiguration is pretty much right after the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Now, in Matthew, we can probably get a sense that there's a, a few more days that, that are separating those events. But in either case, it's an amazing story that first and foremost gives testimony of the true nature of Jesus as the Son of God, but also one that shows how Jesus gives opportunities to his disciples to understand and live out this balance of life's relationships in three dimensions. So to do that, I want you to put yourself in the disciples' place, okay? I want you to kind of imagine yourself as Peter or James or John, and you can choose whichever one you want, all right? And I want you to place yourself there on the mountaintop with Jesus. 
But not the Jesus who you had been spending all that time with before. This was a different Jesus up there on the mountaintop. The appearance of his face was altered. His clothes were dazzling. He transfigured, and, and his true glory and the true identity of him, not that he hadn't said it before, but now in its fullness, is there before you. The disciples, they were in the presence of God in his glory and in his might. And not just in the presence of the Son, of the Son but in the presence of the Father himself. The story there in Luke 9 says they were enveloped in a cloud. You almost get the same picture and idea of the cloud that was on top of the mountain, Mount Sinai. And there God spoke to Moses. And there is Moses speaking again. And then you hear the Father's voice. This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to Him. You cannot get any closer to God this side of heaven. Or can we? When you think about it, in the Word of God that we heard today, that is God speaking to you. Just as sure as Peter and James and John heard the voice of God on that mountain, so too you hear that voice through his word. And in a moment, we're going to come to the Lord's table. And there we are going to touch him and receive him unto ourselves. We will become one with God, one with Jesus, and He with us as we touch Him and receive His true body and true blood that is with and underneath and in those elements of bread and wine. And when you leave the altar, you have a moment to go back to your seat and to pray and to talk to Him, just the two of you, about what's going on. And you know, when you leave the church, because it doesn't have to stay right here, when you leave the church, guess what? You'll have the same moments. God will give you time to do that one-on-one -on -one with God, just the two of you, to talk to Him and to listen to Him in prayer and in His Word. Relationship up with God. But let's go back to the mountain. And there we see how valued relationships with other disciples, with other followers of Jesus, really are. There, Peter, James, and John, when they see Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus, they're ready to set up shelters for them. One for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And the reason behind that is that they might stay there with one another for a while. Now, that was not a wrong thing for them to say. In fact, honestly, I think it's a pretty understandable thing for them to say. Because how precious are the opportunities that we have to spend time with one another. Great saints of the faith. How precious those moments are. To share our faith in the transfigured, crucified, and risen one. Just like Peter, James, John, Moses, and Elijah were all doing at that time. And don't we set up shelters to do that very thing? <laughs> look around, look up. Aren't we in one of them right now? Because it's good to be here. It's, it's good for us to be with one another. 
We come to worship. We come to Bible study. We come here not just for ourselves. There's a lot of people who will talk about their faith and say, well, that's just between me and God, and, and I don't need to be around others. But that's not what the Bible shows. We need the one-on-one, -on -one, yes, but we come here also for each other to encourage, to lift each other up. This is God's design, and it is good. But we're not to stay here and become recluses in the house of God. That's not what he wants from us. Jesus led the disciples down the mountain. And on coming down, that was the beginning of his final leg to Jerusalem and to his suffering and his death and his resurrection. And as they began that journey, what, or, or I should say, who was the first thing or the first people that they encountered? It was the crowd. As they came down, they encountered the crowd. And there, the disciples found themselves reaching out to the world, trying to overcome the evil that was present with this demon in this person. The disciples were living out their lives in that other dimension, reaching out. Now, they weren't able to remove the demon. They failed in doing so. Jesus did it for them. But instead of looking at their failure, I would say, look at their success. Because before the crowd met Jesus, they met the disciples who were living their lives out in relationship in three dimensions. They had been in the cloud and heard the voice of the Father. They had been on the mountain in the presence of great fellow disciples. And now... They were out in the crowd, in the world. And what they learned is that to be in the world, to be out in the world, starts with also needing to be close to him. To be close to Jesus and to have one another to encourage each other in the process. We can learn a lot from the disciples. This morning, as soon as we walk out these doors... We are going to be out in the world. Now, maybe there's not a crowd waiting for you when you get out that door. I don't see anybody just yet. But maybe on your way home, if you grab a bite to eat at a restaurant, there will be a crowd. Or if you stop by on your way home and go to the store, pick up a few items at the grocery store, there's going to be a crowd. Or if you go out to the baseball fields, There'll be a crowd, or going back to school, or work, and I know tomorrow's a holiday, so if it's not tomorrow, it's Tuesday, but there are going to be crowds. We invariably are going to spend time in the community, out in the world, giving witness, being a witness to Christ and His love in our vocation, in the way we live our lives, in how we do our work in how we spend time with our families, in how we rest, in how we play, in the way we live out the design that God has established for us in this creation. To live a life in balance with time for the world around us, time for each other, and time for God. It is a life lived in three dimensions, what are they? Up, in, and out. And all of it to his glory. Amen.